I'm here at the University of Manitoba campus at the Bald Eagle Lodge. I wanted to do our land acknowledgement here. We are on Treaty 1 land, first entrusted by Creator God to the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, homeland of the Métis Nation. creator together, God would receive great glory. When we come together, we don't start worship and then end it when we close out YouTube. We are joining in the ongoing heavenly worship. It's eternal. And just as we worship God to bring God great glory, I believe when we are open to receiving blessing and a message, we will receive that amidst worship too. Let's take a breath together and know that we are joining in worship that never ends. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my God. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start God, you know that we do not always call upon your name. We do not keep our eyes fixed above the waves. Too often we can forget that in your embrace we find rest. Thank you for keeping your loving embrace available at all times. May your spirit lead us to trust this and welcome it. May your spirit lead us inward to encounter the indwelling of peace. Savior, 
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. sea and sky I have heard my people cry all who dwell in dark and sin my hand will save I who made the stars of night I will make the darkness bright who will bear my light to them whom shall I send For love of them, they turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? the night. I 
I will go. I will go. If you lead me, if you lead, I will hold, I will hold your people in my heart. People in my heart. I the Lord of wind and flame. I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. I'm so grateful to have the honor of introducing our guest preacher, Reverend Dr. Ross Lockhart. Ross is from Winnipeg originally, but now resides in Vancouver, where he is the Dean of St. Andrew's Hall. And he also teaches at the Vancouver School of Theology. Ross is a really great and a funny guy, and I've always enjoyed listening to him, whether that's been speaking at a conference, listening to his lectures, or a sermon. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your servant, Ross. We thank you that he has come to bless this community with your word. Open our hearts to receive your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, friends at Prairie Presbyterian Church in the Holy Land of Manitoba, my uh, hometown of Winnipeg. Great to be able to worship with you. Ross Lockhart here, a Dean of St. Andrew's Hall in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And uh, just uh, a joy to be able to have this time of worship. Thanks to those who have led in liturgy and scripture reading and prayers and music uh, already. Um, anytime uh, friends like Matt and Jen say, can you? The answer is yes. So, uh, really pleased to have the invitation uh, from friends at Prairie to be in worship today. And uh, it's uh, a real privilege to be able to, to worship God, even in this way. I'm mindful of the various restrictions across the country, uh, talking with uh, family and friends in Manitoba, but also Ontario and Quebec. All of us are navigating different uh, regulations and restrictions and uh, praying for the end of the pandemic. So, uh, I add my prayers uh, to yours this day as well for a world that is uh, challenged and hurting and how good it is to be able to turn to God's Word at this time and to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. I prepared a a time uh, for our sermon together that includes some PowerPoint slides. I'll load those in a moment, but let's begin with a prayer. Let's pray. A gracious God, we do delight in your presence. We are humbled by the way in which you continue to seek us out, fallible, fragile, sinful human beings who uh, so consistently disappoint and turn away from you, and yet you do not give up on us. Your call upon our lives is precious, and we thank you for all those gathered in worship today in Prairie Presbyterian, for the ways in which you have called members of this church through baptism to love and to serve you and to love and serve their neighbor. So bless us now in this time of teaching and reflection that we may all be students under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the true teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll just load up the PowerPoint here and uh, we'll begin our reflection time together. Entitled uh, The Message Today Call Answer. Call Answer. Pastor, was God more active in the world back in Bible times? 
than God is today. Now, I've been asked this question over many years in many different Bible studies or standing at the door, shaking hands. Remember when we used to be able to shake hands? And often there was a story read that day in the small group ministry, or maybe it was read in Sunday worship that had a fantastic moment of God's revelation. Let's uh, imagine together uh, a story that was told, say, of a burning bush, a Red Sea parted, a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night, water from a rock, manna on the ground, walls tumbling down around Jericho, Elijah's victory over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, donkeys that talk, hey, even axe heads that float, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace preserved. And then we haven't even turned to the New Testament yet, miracles of Jesus, miraculous events in the book of Acts. Yeah, it's easy to see in the midst of what appears to be our everyday, ordinary lives, how God might be less active than in earlier days. I I understand where that question comes from. And then we read today's story from the lectionary, 1 Samuel, that begins, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, visions were not widespread. Hmm, maybe we misjudge just how easily the people of God experienced God's presence once in the promised land, or indeed all those years waiting for rescue and liberation in Egypt, or in New Testament times suffering under foreign occupation, waiting for the Messiah. We are now in the season of Epiphany, of course, the season that follows Christmas. And we hear stories of Jesus dedicated in the temple and Jesus as a child teaching in the temple. Centuries earlier, the Old Testament records this story that we heard today of God's divine revelation to a young boy to introduce a significant shift from the traditional priestly family when Israel was ruled by judges I don't know if you have a favorite judge, mine's Gideon personally, to a new line of prophets and kings. So this first Samuel story is a pivotal transition story in what God is doing in the world. That's why often it is yoked with these stories post-Christmas of Jesus. So too, in the coming of Jesus, we see God shift away from the established temple priesthood to the priesthood of Christ. Think about uh, the book of Hebrews, for example. In Samuel 2, 26, 1 Samuel 2, 26, uh, we hear that Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. Hmm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? What about uh, Luke 2, 40? Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Samuel, as we know, is the child that his mother, Hannah, never thought God would give her. Remember her pleading outside Eli the priest's tent for blessing and the decision of Hannah once she received the gift of this child to dedicate Samuel into the priest's service. Indeed, the season of Epiphany begins with Mary welcoming Jesus, the unexpected gift from God announced by surprise by the angel Gabriel. So Mary takes Jesus with Joseph to dedicate him in the temple. Maybe uh, maybe Matt was preaching on that just a week or two ago uh, in the lectionary. And in the season following Christmas, we love to tell the story, right, of Simeon in the temple uh, depicted here uh, and who recognizes the promised Messiah. We also tell of who's the person, look at the central picture here in the background, Anna, the prophetess who has been waiting for the Savior. I'll show you some uh, other pictures here. This is uh, when they took Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. Now, Anna, of course, is focused on God's blessing, God's salvation. She yearned to see and experience God's goodness in its fullness, in its fullest expression. And I wonder, whenever we are in worship together, 
maybe there are some who are worshiping us with us today that find themselves in a similar place and stage of life. You've lived long enough to look back and see what was important and urgent many years ago, and it no longer seems to hold sway. When you have an awareness of God's blessing in your life and long for a deeper communion with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That was the stage of life and wisdom and maturity that Anna had reached. She was focused on God's blessing, on his salvation. As Soren Kierkegaard once said, purity of heart is to will one thing. And for Anna, that was to be near Jesus, to see salvation dawn. Now, you may be thinking, okay, I get that Luke was drawing on the Samuel imagery. But think about this. In the Greek, Anna is Hannah. Same name as Samuel's mom, recalling the Old Testament character who longs for a child and seeks Eli's blessing. Here, this Hannah 2.0 in the temple sees with her own eyes the gift of the child and throws her lot in with the one who's dying and rising will change everything. So this reading from 1 Samuel has major echoes in the New Testament. That's why we read it, I think, in the season of Epiphany that follows Christmas. And so this is a reminder that God is at work in the world through surprising acts of revelation if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. So let's jump into the story. It's a great story. Some of you, if you were raised in the church, got this story in Sunday school. If you're adult converts, maybe you've come across this in Bible study and so forth. Samuel, the young boy, serving alongside the frail and aging priest Eli, is lying down at night in the temple. Now, remember, this is pre-King Saul, King David, and most importantly, King Solomon, when we're thinking about the temple. So, it's not the grand temple built by King Solomon and remodeled majorly by King Herod that today we visit uh, the retaining wall, Temple Mount, when we do pilgrimage tours to Jerusalem. No, this is just a simple structure, kind of like, uh, you know, camping in Lake of the Woods or going up to uh, Rhiney Mountain National Park and pitching a tent. It's, it's basically a tent, probably a large tent, that had the holiest of holies section marked off. The Ark of the Covenant was there, and Samuel sleeps close to it, almost like one of our kids might sleep with a teddy bear. It is at this time with old Eli, his eyesight failing, and his young temple helper Samuel curled up for sleep, that the boy hears his voice being called clearly, Samuel, Samuel, it echoes through the night. He pops up to see what the aging priest needs. The Eli sends him back to, get, back to bed. And again, it happens. And the Bible tells us Samuel's confused since he did not know the Lord. He may sleep with the Ark of the Covenant like a teddy bear, but he lacked any lived experience of God's presence at that moment. Again, Eli sends him back to bed the second time. When it happens a third time, though, Eli's, what shall we call them, his spiritual spidey senses begin to tingle. It must be the Lord, the aging priest thinks, and gives instructions to the boy on how to respond to the Lord's prompting. Now, remember, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. And this foreboding Old Testament language that opens the scene of God's call of Samuel might just as easily show up in many congregational annual reports these days. In a time of institutional uncertainty, it is all too easy for churches to look longingly to the past or forward in fear. As one who, uh, for the last eight years now, has uh, served as a pastor seconded to the seminary, for this season of my ordained life, I'm all too aware of how the need for quality leaders for Christ's church is a challenge in the church and in the seminary. Where will we get our next generation, next generation of quality leaders from for Christ's church? And how do we discern the right kind of leaders so we end up with, to borrow language from my mentor, Reverend Dr. Stephen Ferris, ministers not of mischief, or maintenance, but of mission. 
Now, of course, it's not just about getting ordained leaders. It's about recognizing that through our baptism, God calls all of us into ministry. That's why I enjoy here at St. Andrew's Hall, the focus is not just on preparing pastors, but on equipping uh, baptized Christians, lay people, ruling elders, and teaching elders for leadership in Christ's church. Indeed, as we think about uh, even in our own Presbyterian tradition, in the Book of Forms, section 202, I know you all have the Book of Forms under your uh, pillow to read at night, but it's important. It says this, sessions and presbyteries are enjoined to make diligent and careful inquiry whether any individuals should be specially directed to the claims of Christ upon them with respect to the ministry, to aid and encourage in all proper ways suitable young men and women to consecrate themselves to this sacred vocation. I love that. In other words, presbyteries, but most importantly, I think on the ground sessions, our elders should be looking to see who has leadership gifts. Now, the Book of Form intends that that's towards formal ordained leadership, but I think it's important that we think in terms of, that are more broad, that we think in terms of every baptized Christian. How are we helping people in our church hear God's call like Samuel and interpret it like Eli, no matter what their daily work may be and so forth. It's about their discipleship. Our local churches are called by God to help Christians discover, in Frederick Beekner's language, their vocation as the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deep need. A call from God, after all, is an assignment. It's just for a time. A call is episodic. Think about all the different stages of your life. You've been called to different things in different seasons. But a vocation, that's a longer arc that God has us on. It's a lifelong pursuit of discipleship, what Eugene Peterson called a long walk of obedience in the same direction. So at Prairie, how are you helping church members discern God's calling? Because every Samuel needs an Eli. We all need help discerning. That comes through prayerful discernment. The elders have a key role in that. Theological education, I don't just mean degrees in order to be a leader in the church, but here at St. Andrew's Hall through the Center for Missional Leadership, we offer um, retreats, conferences, uh, the missional certificate program. We're really trying to equip people at the local level. And part of that is a posture for lifelong learning for all of us. We, we need to, to lean into what God is doing in this time and place and to be equipped for that ministry. After all, in the Samuel story and in our stories, it's God who calls us. God is the primary agent of grace. We're about the business of discerning and then following that call. Young Samuel listens carefully to the spiritual wisdom of the old priest Eli. Indeed, when he hears his name called a third time, he's ready. Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, just wait for a second. Fascinating. Remember, Eli can't see. Samuel apparently can't hear. They need each other. Different gifts. As I was sitting with a text this week here in my office and thinking of the privilege of worshiping with you in Winnipeg, I wish I was in Winnipeg with you. Uh, it's been a while since I've been able to be in person about a year and worship with you. That'll happen again. I was reminded of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12. You know this one? I'm not going to read it through. You can read it through as I'm uh, preaching. But essentially, it's this great text to remind us that we as individuals are part of the larger body of Christ and we need each other. We need the different parts of the body in order to be whole. As it is, there are many parts, but one body, as Paul preaches. So, here's a, a question that may be a bit of a challenge. Maybe you can talk about this together in uh, breakout rooms next time you meet or in your small group studies. What gifts has God given you? And who in the community needs these gifts that you have in order to hear God's call? 
And then you know the question is coming next. What gifts has God given the community at Prairie that you don't have, but you need these gifts in order to hear God's call yourself? Missiologist David Fitch has said that seeing God at work in the world today can be really difficult. God requires witnesses to tend to God's faithful presence in the world in order to be able to say, look, here's God, or to come alongside others when we sense God is active in their life. You know, just this week, as I was preparing this message, I, I had a conversation with a friend here in Vancouver. Like me, he's a prairie guy that's ended up on the West Coast. And he was telling me he's not a, not a believer. He was raised in the church, but kind of part of the alumni association after Sunday school. And uh, he was telling me that his dad had a fall on the farm in Saskatchewan. Uh, and so he got on the first flight home, even with all the COVID protocols, he flew immediately home uh, to make sure his dad was okay and to finish the harvest this fall. He left kind of his white collar job here in Vancouver uh, in order to, to go and do the real work on the farm, as he calls it. Um, and he was reflecting with me on how his dad had a fall from a combine and if he had just fallen this way or that way, the doctor said it would have been bad news. But as a result, his dad was relatively okay, shaken, bruised, but okay. My friend said, I, I sat one day taking in harvest and I thought, wow, like someone was really looking out for my dad. I was really shaken by that. And it led into a beautiful conversation about who that someone might be looking after his dad, just a little opening, a moment. Could it be that my friend heard his name being called for the first time in a long time? What kind of conversations like that do you think God will place you or me in this week? God is opening up these opportunities. And for those of us who know and love the Lord, it often falls to us to be able to say, I think that might be God to gesture, to point with grace and humility towards God's activity in the world. Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, it's important also to note that the lectionary tries its best to sanitize the story here. If you notice in the lectionary reading, there's brackets for the second half of the reading. Now, this is just my own stuff. Pastor Matt will have to give his own opinion on this. But I'm always highly suspicious in the lectionary when I see brackets, parts of scripture bracketed out. I often think it's an attempt for those who put together the lectionary to kind of clean up or sanitize or to remove the more awkward parts of scripture. I find the awkward parts often where God has revealed the most to me. So what did they try to bracket out that we've included in worship today? Well, it includes the part, of course, where Samuel responds, follows Eli's advice, and, and then God speaks to Samuel. So why wouldn't they want that included in the lectionary? Well, it's what God says is problematic. He informs Samuel that the time of Eli is coming to an end, particularly because his two sons, which if you know the tradition of PK, preacher's kids, of which I have three, uh, and uh, it's not always a great reputation, Eli the priest's two sons are like the original PK. They were not good guys, and they were doing bad things and taking advantage of people in the name of God. And God said, mm, that's it. And just so that we're not too smug about this, uh, Samuel himself, when he grows older and becomes um, a, a legendary prophet himself, he appoints his two sons, or appoints his sons, I should say, uh, as yeah, his two sons, uh, as uh, this is um, in later on in First Samuel, he appoints them as the final judges over Israel. And uh, the Bible says they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So Samuel doesn't have a great reputation either. All that to say, he's finally called. If you stop with the first part of the reading, it's kind of this feel good. Um, warm, individualistic call. God's called my name. But it's important to include the second part because God's called his name not for Samuel's sake, 
but to deliver a message for the sake of the people of Israel and indeed the whole world, that God's about to do something new. The time of the judges is coming to an end. The time of kings and prophets is beginning. And why is this important? Because, of course, the kings that will be appointed, Saul is a disappointment. And then comes David in Samuel's time. And an ancestor or a descendant of David, of course, will be born in a manger in Bethlehem. God is about to do something new. And friends, we too are caught up in this story of God doing something new in the world. God in Jesus Christ has redeemed this fallen world from sin and sorrow through the cross of Christ. God is reconciling all things to himself through Jesus, even now as we gather in this time of worship. God has adopted us by grace, grafted us onto Israel, the family of faith. Therefore, when we think about Samuel and Eli today, there are kin, and God is knitting together a people called church with the same truth that we need each other to see and hear God at work in the world, just as Eli and Samuel needed each other. Therefore, in this season of light, amidst all the darkness that is present in the world right now, and there is so much of it, may God help us to attend to God's presence, to see and hear the divine at work, and to encourage one another. God's call and God's message to us, even when it's clear, is not easy. I love this picture that we end with today. This is by a Chinese Christian artist who we had give a lecture here at the Vancouver School of Theology. I actually have this painting in my home, and it's entitled Calling Disciples. And what I love about it is, of course, it's the call at the seashore of Galilee by Jesus. But look at Zebedee in the boat, waving goodbye to his boys. There is both blessing, but I wonder a bit of sadness in that as well. This is the reality that God's call is not easy. It's often not easy to hear and at times more difficult to follow. That's why we need each other, friends, a Prairie Presbyterian and throughout all our congregations across the country in the body of Christ to help hear, see, and follow Jesus. He is still calling. Can you hear him? His way is a grace-filled path a narrow gate, the way, the truth, and the life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining in worship today with Prairie Presbyterian Church. A big thank you to Ross Lockhart for sharing your wisdom with us today through that sermon. We so appreciate you coming to us from Vancouver uh, and uh, sharing with us today. Uh, a reminder that you can join in Coffee Time, which is happening pretty much right now. Uh, you could do that through the, the Zoom link that's been sent out in our reminder email. And if you're not getting those emails, uh, feel free to subscribe to our weekly email at prairiechurch.ca. Also on the website, you can give a donation, a financial offering. Um, but if you're not part of Prairie or if you're coming from a different um, faith community, um, please continue to support the faith community of which you're a part. Uh, we would, uh, we really are trying to encourage that as uh, many faith communities are in need of uh, that kind of financial support. Um, uh, we will be giving a bit of a financial update pretty soon. Um, probably just once uh, Jen and I are back from study leave, we'll, we'll put something together to give you an update. But just so you know, toward the end of 2020, um, the offerings were really great. Um, we are so thankful for all of you who gave extra donations toward the end of the year. Uh, it really helped us uh, actually meet our goals and um, not be in a deficit situation in 2020, which is really remarkable. So we're so thankful for you, um, for everyone who pulled together to, to make those donations. Um, and we are going to continue to need that kind of support uh, in 2021, obviously, as we're, as we're not gathered together um, in person right now. So I pray that 
uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be, will be with each one of you today and forever. Amen.